Wow. I'm sure somebody's going to email us about that. Uh, offended, but welcome to Salty. Hey, let's take a moment. Let's welcome all of our locations and all those who watch online. We are so glad that you're with us today. Uh, and uh, my name is Joey. I'm the lead pastor here at the Block Church. And we begin a brand new teaching series today, Salty. And uh, I hope you didn't come in here offended. Uh, but uh, even if you did, I'm going to help you overcome that over the next few weeks. Uh, before we dive into God's word, I want to share something super exciting uh, with all of you. Uh, did you know that the Block Church turns five years old in September? Wow. Wow five years, and uh, it's amazing to celebrate God's faithfulness, and that I was, we were just singing that uh, he's a way maker and a miracle worker, man, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't tell you all the ways that he's been a way maker and miracle worker, you see it, but then there's that, the, some of that stuff that you can't see, uh, but we're going to celebrate and try to communicate all that uh, on September 8th, so I would love for everybody to save that date, please try not to go out of town that day, try to be here, bring somebody, we're going to be uh, back, we did this for our second Easter, we're going to be back at the Fillmore in Fishtown for our five year anniversary, and uh, you'll see some pictures of the Fillmore. We did that uh, our second Easter. It was awesome. We did one service. This time we're going to do two services and we're going to fill the Fillmore twice. You're going to you're going to bring some folks along. It's going to be a very 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 special day. Uh, so September 8th, write that down our 5 year anniversary. Come on somebody. God is so good. It's going to be a beautiful day. All right, so get that date saved. All right, well, let's dive in. Five-week teaching series uh, called Salty, and uh, we're going to deal with offense over the next five weeks. I needed a lot of time uh, to share this. I couldn't just cut you up real quick and then just throw you to the side. I needed, I needed five good weeks to do some surgery. Uh, me and Jesus and uh, your location pastors, we're going to be up here. And, uh, and it's going to be great. We're going to try to have fun, and we're going we're gonna to move slowly. Uh, but I believe that if we can conquer this area of our life that will uh, be continual, uh, that we'll have to deal with, uh, I believe we can live that abundant life and that victorious life that, we, uh, that God promises us. And so, uh, but I, I, was, I was thinking about things that are popular, stupid things that are popular, okay? Uh, like, for instance... I have a son now, and uh, Baby Shark and Daddy Finger, why? Who did that? If I see you in public, I might Baby Shark you right there. Like, I don't know. Like, like why? Why is this popular? It's just unbelievable. Every single morning, my son asks to listen to Baby Shark. It's uh, why, is, why did fidget spinners get popular? Anybody? I mean, that was popular for like a minute. I was going to try it up here, but then I realized that would be a disaster. Sparkling water, that got popular lately. Okay, sparkling water. Any of you bougie millennials that drink uh, sparkling water, you don't even like it. You know, you just feel like you got to order it. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, this is crazy. Uh, they have this thing on YouTube uh, where kids are watching kids play with toys. Why? How? 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 And kids sit there and watch this and love it. It is bizarre. My kid knows what YouTube is, by the way, now. It's, he says, tube. That's what he does. It's amazing. Uh, what else? Fanny packs are popular again and were popular at some point. Why? Uh, you know what else? Uh, popular? This got popular for a while. This is stupid planking. Anybody do that? Okay. Uh, also, Crocs. Crocs. Why? I know some of you are like offended right now that I might, but just stupid things get popular. Would you agree with that? And sometimes stupid people get popular. Uh, I wasn't raising my hand for me by any means. I'm not. But listen, do you know what's popular and trendy right now? It's popular and it's trendy to be offended. It's like to think. And it's clear that the enemy... Uh, is using offense more vividly and more visually, uh, I think, uh, maybe than ever before. And maybe it's because we have media at our disposal that allows us to see everybody else's offense. I would uh, submit to you today that political correctness and offense 
is the unofficial religion of American culture. I submit that to you today. That, that political correctness and offense, it is our unofficial religion. We love it. We are married to it. It, it, is, it is so natural in our culture to be offended by everything that it's almost our religion we're committed to. And that's the title of my message today, by the way, unofficial religion, unofficial religion. And I want us to, to over the next five weeks, uh, do what Paul asks us to do and be countercultural. I want to be renewed in my mind. I want to be transformed. I don't want to conform to the patterns of this world, but I want to be transformed by God's words. And so we have to understand that we are part of and caught up in a sin nature of culture and of society. And not all of it is bad, but there are things that we need to depict and be aware of from the Holy Spirit that help us realize that sometimes the things that we hold on to are hurting us more than helping us. Well, why uh, is it so popular to be offended? Okay, real quick, because it's easy. Things uh, that are easy sometimes are really popular uh, because it gives you something to say or do to feel important. Uh, because it allows you to be nosy. Because people are insecure and need to deflect their own weaknesses and their own zeros in life. So they got to be offended at everybody else or something else. Because they don't want to deal with the lack or what's not going on with them. Or what is. Uh, people don't know how to be in community properly. So e they're easily offended. Uh, because everyone, even people who shouldn't be popular, have a voice through media. Even somebody with two followers has a voice, and it's out there, right? So it's popular. Uh, because if you don't have an, a, a stance or an opinion on the matter, uh, you're foolish, you're dumb, uh, and you're lame. That's not true. But, but that's, the, that, that, that's the picture that we've painted. How can you not have an opinion? For you to say, I don't know, that's a sign of weakness, but it's not. I would submit to you today that it's okay for you to go, you know what? I'm not sure where I stand on this. Right? That's actually humility. Now, you should form some opinions in life. You shouldn't go through life without knowing. But it's okay for you to go, you know, I'm not sure. Even as a pastor, people ask me questions about the scriptures or about what I believe about a certain subject. And even today, there's times where I have to look at somebody and go, you know what? Actually, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. And sometimes when we're not humble enough, and I'm not sitting here calling myself humble, I'm working on that. But I've learned, and I've been doing this long enough to know that sometimes just saying you don't know is okay. And then go study it and learn the facts before I share something that's flippant. So anyway, that's I think why it's popular to be offended. And today what I want to do, and, and this is all I want to accomplish today because we have five weeks of this series... But all I want to accomplish today is to help us identify what offense is, what it means to be salty, okay? I want, us to, I want us to ask the Holy Spirit, am I offended in any area of my life? That's what I want to accomplish today. I'm not going to give you a bunch of solutions, okay? Uh, you'll, you'll get that over the next couple of weeks. I just want to open myself up and say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And so uh, let, me, let me define salty by way of the Urban Dictionary. This is my second Bible. And salty really originates, listen, it originates from the United States Navy, actually. Uh, it's, a, it's used to describe a disgruntled senior officer. But think about it, that makes sense where they got it from, because the Navy, you know, in the sea, ocean, salt, you get it? Okay. <laughs> but it's also the act of being upset, angry, or bitter as a result of being made fun of or embarrassed. It's also a characteristic of a person who feels out of place, or is feeling attacked. Another way to say salty, as I just described, would be offended. Offended. Now, there is something called a righteous anger. And I'm going to deal with righteous anger in week four of the series. And there are actually things that, that should make you angry. There are actually things that should stir you up and, and make you hot on the inside. There are things that frustrate God, and we will deal with it. 
I don't want to frame this conversation today in regards to righteous anger. You understand that? Take righteous anger out of the equation today. That's not where I'm going. I'm more talking about unrighteous anger. Okay. But, but let me be clear. There are things that are going to frustrate you and upset you. And being salty isn't just necessarily being offended, although that's the overarching picture. Being salty could mean that you're perpetually annoyed and frustrated. And so, anyway, what is offense? Let's dive into that today. And I'm going to use a lot of scripture today. So if you take notes, which you should, maybe just jot down the references. Come back to it in your own personal study that I know all of you do seven days a week. Okay, what is offense? Okay, ultimately, offense is when you are dismayed, disappointed, or defeated by a circumstance or person. Offense becomes dangerous when you allow this trouble to linger for a period of time. Okay, so what I'm saying is, is it's not whether you'll be offended or not. You will get offended at some point. So let, let me just... Let me just Say this for the rest of the series. You're going to get offended, and it's really not the end of the world when you do get offended. All right? So it might not even be sin when you get offended. Uh, you shouldn't perpetually always by everything get offended. But sometimes people are going to wrong you or circumstances are going to happen, and you might even look up at God and go, yo, like I'm a little offended by this. Right? But when we allow offense to linger, we will often do negative things from that offense. And in my opinion, and probably in the opinions of the scriptures, that's really where it becomes sinful. Now, I asked I ask Grace permission to share this story with you, uh, Pastor Grace, uh, for all of you watching online. Okay, the location pastor of Port Richmond, the boss of this church, I think. <laughs> The other day, we were coming in, we had the, the, uh, the level up book release, and it was really late, and I don't know why I did this, but I went to Grace, I was like, can we come in late tomorrow? Can we ask everybody? Why am I asking her? I thought I was in charge, but I'm not, I realize I'm not. Anyway, another story. But, but I asked Pastor Grace to share this story because uh, we have staff meetings at her house every Wednesday. And Grace has a beautiful home, and it's a great God story. She does not, however, have central air. It was a little warm this past week. And uh, just about everybody was giving her a hard time about the temperature in the house. I also let her know that I felt like the coffee that morning was a little burnt. <laughs> I also asked her for sparkling water. Just kidding. No, I didn't. <laughs> But she was like, she, she was so grouchy the rest of the day. Very grouchy. And it, it carried into the next day, I think, also. <laughs> and I'm like, Grace, why are you so grouchy? Now, we are, she's like my sister. So, like, annoying her and bothering at times, it is a joy for me. <laughs> okay. And uh, my wife yells at me all the time about it. But I'm like, it's just part, it's my DNA. I, I must. You know, and, uh, but anyway, I'm like, Grace, seriously, why were you getting so mad at us about this? You know, and she, and she like, didn't tell me and did the whole, I open up my house to you guys. I think it's, you know. <laughs> but then she, I was like, no, but what, like, seriously, like, why should that bother you? Who cares? Like, what, like, seriously. And then I got to the root of it. Like, why was she so defensive? And she's like, you know, I, like, God gave me this home. And, like, I, I kind of made me insecure. It makes me insecure because, like, I opened this home. This is a house of ministry. And, like, I welcome everybody in here. You know, I welcome everybody comes in here. We're doing groups and trainings. And it kind of makes me think, oh, my gosh, can I use my home? You know, and it was like this thing that triggered a defensiveness in her. And, like, we probably shouldn't give her a hard time all that much. But, like, like the, the, there's usually a root to why somebody is defensive and offended. Now, this might be a small thing, right? But like there are bigger things that like, like a situation that happens in somebody's life, you see somebody freak out, but the issue is not normally the issue. There's another issue at play. So what I'd say is that being offended is a defense mechanism a lot of times that attempts to guard against further hurt. The problem is, is that being defensive and being offended, they harden the heart while simultaneously minimizing hope. 
Because what happens when we uh, allow offense, and, and I don't want to spend too much time here, but when we allow offense to capture our heart, uh, it becomes what we say. And, and we, uh, we speak offense and, and we think offense, and then it minimizes hope. And then hope deferred, the Bible says, makes the heart sick. And so then it, what it does is everything we see the world and everything we hear the world, we, are, we, are, we don't have hope. And it affects every relationship encounter, the way that we move, the way that we elevate, the way that we think, and then there are negative consequences to it. So I want to go to Philemon real quick, and uh, this is a great one-chapter book, and it's really about love and forgiveness. And I want to read a couple passages from there, but Paul, the apostle, is speaking to his friend Philemon. I believe Paul is in prison when he's writing this. And he says, I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon. Because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. And I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Amen. A great reason to give. Amen. Your love has given me much joy and comfort. My brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. So he, he shares this to Philemon. Now, Paul is brilliant. He's a great leader. So Paul is, he's basically using the hamburger method here. He's, he's putting the buns on top, the bread, you know, and he's saying, hey, I love you. You're great. I, I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm thankful for you. You do a lot of good things. And then he's getting ready to lay the meat in the middle, like the real stuff. He's ready. He's getting ready to spank his hiney, if you will, okay? <laughs> and then he closes the letter with some more buns, with some more bread. And he's like, hey, I love you, bro. You're great. Come on, let's change the world. But like, that's a great way to communicate to people, by the way, uh, when they're not doing something they should. So, but, but Paul is about to let Philemon know, hey, you're in the wrong. Here's what I'd say. You heard all those good things that Philemon did, right? Yet Philemon, in this text, is offended. Because Onesimus, uh, who is either a slave or he is a servant or something, he has done something to wrong Philemon. Now, they both know Onesimus, and they're both in relationship with him, but Paul is communicating to Philemon, bro, you're offended. And what I'd say to you is whether young in faith, returning to Jesus after a hiatus, spirit-filled, mature, or seasoned, you aren't completely immune to offense. You're not. So, so I, I want to make that very clear that, that here's this guy Philemon who's probably got money and probably doing well and does really great things for the kingdom of God. And Paul, the apostle, who is a genius, who is writing and instructing the churches, is acknowledging that Philemon's a good dude. And even this good dude is not immune to offense. So if Paul is saying that to Philemon... I might submit to you today that it's possible that you could be flying in your relationship with God and then all of a sudden something happened that's outside your control, right? And offense hits you and messes your life up. And the enemy, this is what, I love Stephen Furtick said this, the enemy's agenda is destruction, strategy is division, and his tactic is offense. That's good, huh? Because because the Bible says that the enemy... In John 10.10, 10, the beginning of it, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. So whatever is good, whatever is righteous, whatever is holy, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is functioning by way of the kingdom of God, the enemy is trying to come in and steal and pervert and distort that. And his tactic oftentimes is offense. Now what happens in Philemon Eight, let me read this to you. Hey, he says, I appeal to you, Philemon, to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Which is a whole other thing. How can you be locked up and still be fathering people and loving people? I'm telling you, freedom is a state of mind. It's an ideology. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past. All right, I acknowledge that. When you're dealing with issues, you've got to tell the facts. Facts. That's how I respond these days, by the way. Someone says something, I write facts. Because I am relevant and cool. 
and bald. But now he is very useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. <laughs> I just love this because Philemon is frustrated. He's offended. I mean, I need, Onesimus, he could have stolen something, whatever it was, and Paul's going, hey, bro, the Christ way, the Christian way, the Jesus way is I'm sending him back to you, and you're going to treat him not like a slave, but like a son. Ugh. Does that ever, no, but come on, hold on a second, for a second, let's just be honest. That's the kind of stuff that makes me go, God, mm, don't love Christianity all the time. Because I don't want to treat him like a son. I, I, he stole from me. I want to punch him like I'm in Rocky IV and he's the Russian. You know, like, like, like he took from me. But like, mm, this is the Christian way. This is the Jesus way. And Paul gets it, and then he seals and he says, like I'm sending my very own heart. So if you love me, listen, if you love me, you're going to welcome him back in. And if I love Jesus, I'm not going to hold on to offenses. I'm going to welcome others back in. Come on, can you give God a praise for that for a second? And think about the fact that God loved us, so he welcomed us back in. So as a Christian, I want to ask you a question. Is being or staying offended sinful? I mean, it seems obvious, but I just want to make sure uh, that, that we get it. Now, I know I'm moving slow today. I'm teaching. This is a teaching message. And sometimes you need that, particularly with a subject that you might disagree on or be offended by. So is being offended or staying offended sinful? Probably. I mean, most likely it is. A better way that I would say this, though, is, is let, let me just be clear, is staying offended sinful? Okay. So let's just paint a picture, uh, again, of, of what staying offended means. To take offense and stay offended means you're not offering any grace. To stay offended. To stay offended is to revel in self-righteousness. That's pride. Which is the root of all the issues on planet Earth. And it's why you and I aren't running around naked in a garden right now. It's why I gotta watch what I eat, because of pride. Because we should be in a garden relaxing. But instead, pride came in and it stole the enemy. To live offended is to become addicted to the feeling of control. Think about this. It is a controlling spirit to live offended. It's control. I'm in charge of you. Now I have the power play. And some of us who have been hurt sorely and badly by people or circumstances, we stay offended because it allows us to be in control because we don't want to be hurt again. And there's grace for that. Thank you, Jesus. But it's not a fun life to live. And this is real stuff. Somebody could have hurt you, divorced you, molested you, failed you, stolen from you. All the things. And the reality is, is the longer you live in that, the more effect that has on your own mental state and body and mind and spirit. On the last week of this series, I'm interviewing a psychologist a doctor on the effects of offense on our body, our mind, and our emotions. And you will be surprised and probably never offended again knowing that it might be worse than your Diet Coke and what that's doing to you. Sorry, Diet Coke, you do not sponsor these sermons. <laughs> but you can if you want. I can take that back. We can edit it out. God bless you. To stay offended, listen to this, listen to this, stay with me. To stay offended is to not allow others to have from your life what you've asked God for your life. I'll say it again because you really need to clap and shout and holler. I know that hits you and you're thinking about that. To stay offended is to not allow others to have from your life what you've asked God to allow for your life. Come on, let's give God a praise on that. God help us. 
Staying offended is simply hypocritical. Hey, now again, you decide if staying offended is sinful or not. I'm just posing it to you. I'm not your God. Matthew 5, 38, Jesus says, uh, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them on the other cheek also. No! And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand them over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Whew, that's the hardest one for me, I'll be honest. I don't like to run. <laughs> Sue me, take my stuff. Please don't make me go outside and walk with you. <laughs> miles. We talking miles. We talking about miles. Okay. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Okay, it, obviously this text is about people who have wronged you. Like, am I allowed to stay? I mean, is it sin for me to stay offended? It seems like Jesus might be suggesting that if someone offends you, do the opposite and go with them. Now, I've taught on relationships and we've done series and, and we certainly could break that scripture down and talk about navigating bad people for your life and sometimes you need a break and you need seasons away and all of that may be true. But the question I'm posing to you is, is it sinful to stay offended? I think you've got to decide that. It seems like it's clear and I rather err on the side of like, man, I probably shouldn't. I probably should work this out than stay there because it's affecting my life and it might not please God. And like, here's the way that I live. L listen to me, every person. The way that I live is if I'm unclear about something, I'm always gonna lean on the side of radical because I know that's what Jesus was. I'm always gonna lean on the side of, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over the top more than enough because I love God. And like, if I'm attempting or trying to please him, in my own messed up, broken state, like, like I'm going to do that. I'm going to lean in that direction instead of toe the line and like get in by the skin of my teeth. Because I want more of God. And I know that there's no sacrifice that I can make that will be greater than the sacrifice Jesus already made. Like, like, like... Like, I, I, I'm going to give above and beyond because like I'd rather err on that side of being generous because I know how faithful God's been. He's like, never let me down. In some seasons and scenarios where I should be way down, or I'm going to err on the side of forgiveness or saying I'm sorry. Like, I'm going to lean on that side because I just, part of me just wants to see if God is who he says he is. And he always shows up, especially when I listen to his voice. How can offense, let me ask you two more questions, got a few more minutes left. How can offense be used for our good and the good of our community? Because God's working out all things for our good, for those who are called according to his purpose, right? And so even bad things that happen can be used for good. Uh, let me explain this. When offense is handled swiftly and biblically, offenses cause us to handle issues in a way that brings us together and teaches us about ourselves. They can be good even when they hurt. I'm going to move through this quick, okay? But here's the first thing. When offense comes, we are more joyful and a peaceful community when we deal with it biblically. Matthew eleven six, 6. And blessed, joyful, favored by God is he who does not take offense at me. Jesus is talking about my teachings. Accepting me as the Messiah and trusting confidently in my message of salvation. I love the language he uses. Joyful and peaceful, favored by God. So we become a more joyful and peaceful community. That's how it's working out for our good. We are a more controlled and respected community. Proverbs 19, 11. Sensible people control their temper and they earn respect by overlooking wrongs. So we become a more controlled and respected community. You want respect, you got to give respect. And sometimes you got to overlook wrongs and not be so petty. 
Which, by the way, your location pastor is preaching next week about the problem with petty. But anyway, that's next week. So, listen, we are a more mature, or mature, so no one gets mad at me, community. Okay, Luke 17, 3. So watch yourselves. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Uh, then if there's repentance, forgive. But even if the person wrongs you seven times a day, and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. So we become mature in this because, listen, somebody who keeps sinning against you, at some point, they're probably going to go, all right, I got to stop this. This is craziness. And it forces us to mature. Lastly, offense can help us because it makes us a more Christ-like community. Matthew 18, 21, I love this. Uh, Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Question mark. No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. No. <laughs> you know, it's like, but look at it, it's right there. Like 70 times seven. So I don't even know that number because I'm not great at math, but here's what I know. That's going to cause us to be more Christ-like. Yeah. Right, so sometimes offense happens and God allows it, failure or circumstance or situation, he allows it. Because some of it is producing maturity and goodness in our life. It's producing unity. And I know this, that when there's conflict, listen to me, when there's conflict in your relationships, in your life, when dealt with biblically and swiftly, it always causes us to grow and a lot of times causes us to be tighter and better in community. All right, so here's the last one. This is not a question necessarily, but it's, it's for you to think about and internally process. And I'd say, I'm, I'm going to give you 10 things. You're offended if, dot, dot, dot. You're offended if. Now, Pastor Paul last week gave us 10 reasons why we should get baptized or excuses we make. So I felt like I was okay to give you 10 things. <laughs> because he's my pastor and he did it, so I'm going to. And there's probably more, but this is just a few quick little tidbits to, to know and to identify if you are offended. Here's the first one. You're impossible to please. You're either a brat or you're offended. And probably it might be both. Uh, number two, you're regularly or extremely defensive. Like, like somebody who's super salty is, is always defensive. Like, chill out, relax. But it might be that there's an issue underlying the reason for being defensive. Number three, you're winning or you've won in life, but you're still mad. And you can't enjoy your wins because you're offended. Number four, you can't celebrate anyone else's success. I mean, insecurity is a huge sign of offense somewhere. Why? Why are you mad? Why can't you celebrate anyone else's victory? Why? What happened to you? Why are you so offended? Did somebody steal something from you when you were a child or somewhere else in your life? And so now all you are is you're motivated by what you lost, so you're offended. And you can't celebrate anyone else. Number five, if you can't disagree and have a civil conversation. Like, if you can't hear another person's perspective and you automatically turn it off and you just disagree and you can't shut up long enough, you might be actually offended. Number six, you can't handle or you mock my expression of worship, my expression of praise. So if you see me lifting my hands or kneeling or weeping or crying out to God or praying at somebody, and you, you mock it or you can't handle it or you freak out on somebody's stillness, even if somebody is, is intellectually connected with God but you're offended by it, you might be offended or bothered by it, you might be offended. Number seven, you're quick to anger. Quick to anger. I mean, I mean it is first thing you do is get angry. You might have a frustration problem or a pattern or there might be a fence deep down. Number eight, 
you only get to speak your mind, but no one else can. Only, you, only your opinion matters. Only you get to speak your mind. Number nine, when something simple turns into something serious. Like everything simple turns into something serious. And number 10, you're forgetful of the cross. Like when we're so quick to forget how Jesus hung and how he died and how he knew that we would keep offending him and keep failing him and keep sinning against him even after he hung on the cross. When we are quick to forget the cross, we might be offended. See, you and I are not meant to be salty. We're meant to be salt and light. And there's a difference. Uh, there's a difference uh, between just the right amount of salt that adds flavor and way too much that's salty and bitter. We add a flavor to the world as believers. But when we are salty, when we are offended, it, we add bitterness. And nobody wants to taste what we're a part of. And if the church would just stop living so offended, we might see the progress and the revival and the move of God that we've been praying for and believing for. I don't want to live this way. I don't want to forget the cross. And what God did for me and does for me every day, how can I hold it against him or somebody else? And the reality is that some of us today, we're offended at God. We're offended that God didn't give us what we wanted when we wanted it, or if somebody took something, or God didn't protect me, or could God just be developing a story that changes and transforms the world? And Jesus, he said this as I conclude this message. He said, on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers then gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Here Jesus is on the cross watching people gamble for his clothes. I mean, watching his friends betray him and try to murder him, who he gave everything to. Was Jesus offended? Was he hurt? It's possible, like, mm, that, that would have stung. Yet Jesus still goes to the cross to drop the offense. And my goal today is to not give you solutions and not even tell you how or if you should drop the offense. My goal today is to invite the Holy Spirit, to invite the Holy Spirit and say, is there offense in my life? So in every location, and I want uh, the broadcast to continue to roll, to continue to go, at every location, stand to your feet and bow your head. Nobody moving if you don't have to. Bow your head and close your eyes. And I want to just take 30 seconds on camera at every location. And I want to ask the Holy Spirit. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, am I offended? Holy Spirit, like a highlighter, like I'm highlighting my Bible or a textbook. Highlight if there is offense in my life. Let's just take a few seconds and ask. Father, help us. Show us where in our life we're offended. If there are things that you're not pleased with, we need you and we want to hear from you. Holy Spirit, reveal to us where in our life we might have crossed you, where somebody might have crossed us. Help us deal with it. Holy Spirit, highlight it. And over the next few weeks, God, give us freedom in this area of our life. We need you in Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen.